My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. Other people want to make friends. I'm just trying to save their money. My job is not just to entertain, but put days like today into context. So call me at 1-800-743-CNBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. Trillions of dollars were lost today, with the Dow sinking more than 22 points, S&P falling 0.95%, and the Nasdaq losing 0.84%. Should that decline have happened? Was it a mistake to sell based on one admittedly hotter-than-expected consumer price index reading, even though that's only because the people setting the expectations seem almost brain-dead to me? Tonight, I want to do the unthinkable. I'm going to question the basic premise, not of selling. The inflation numbers truly get too hot. There are many companies that will be in a jam because they're heavily indebted and need to raise money. They want the Fed to cut rates, which it won't do until inflation dies down. These stocks should definitely go lower if inflation gets any hotter, as should the expensive growth stocks that are objectively worth less in a world where inflation keeps eroding the purchasing power of their future earnings. So let's put that aside. The premise I want to question is the accuracy of the index itself, the CPI, which originates from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Because you know what? I think it's suspect. I'm not talking about the absolute numbers. I'm talking about the trend lines, because the trend lines suggest that selling in response to this report may have been and could be a mistake. Remember where I'm coming from. At the beginning of the year, I said the market's consensus estimates of six rate cuts was, frankly, ridiculous. I've repeatedly said that we need either no rate cuts or one rate cut, and that's it. No more than that. Lately, I've questioned whether the Fed stopped tightening too soon, although I can't deny it's been great for the stock market. With that in mind, let's take a hard look at the actual inflation numbers that we got this morning that, that simply, I think, aren't collected all that well and give you little insight into the true hotness of the economy. They overstated how hot it was, to put it in plain English. Let's start with food. What jumps out immediately is a painful jump in meats, poultry, fish, and eggs, up 0.9% month over month, with eggs alone jumping 4.6%. Everybody has to pay for food, so at first glance, this one looks like it could be getting out of control. I say at first glance because this is not an inflation issue. We're having one of the worst outbreaks of avian flu in history. It's an epidemic so powerful that it's crossed over from chickens to dairy cows, and it's threatening to go into all sorts of parts of the food chain. Cow Maine Foods, the largest egg producer in the country, had to kill 1.6 million chickens and temporarily cease operations at its affected facility in Texas. We don't know how bad this disease is going to, got, going to be. We do know supply and demand, though. These food inflation numbers, especially the eggs, reflect the avian flu epidemic. It skewed the numbers. But prices would be much lower if these birds were healthy. I wish they could asterisk somehow, but that may explain... The, what looks to be the way too hot number in food. Energy looks suspect, too. The energy index rose 1.1% in March, with gasoline up 1.7%. Hmm. Let's see. There's a war in the Middle East. That's the war premium. We're also trying to combat Russian oil from hitting the market, which is helpful for Ukraine, but costs us money at the pump. Again, this increase in energy costs has nothing to do with demand and everything to do with supply. So it might be more temporal than it seems. Although not so if the war in the Middle East heats up, as many think. As Rusty Brazil, our go-to energy analyst, said just last Friday, these prices will eventually go back down. It's the war premium. Now, here's where it gets really weird. The Labor Department's report said that the price of natural gas was down 3.2% year-over-year in March. Okay, positive, but let's drill here. Natural gas traded about $2 in March of 2023. But in 2024, we have whole swaths of natural gas that are trading for nothing, or even less than nothing, in a strange aberration that's never been seen for this commodity. In some areas, producers are actually paying you to take it off their hands. That's why nat gas from March of 24 came in not at $2, but at $1.50, which is a 25% decline, not a 3.2% decline. Natural gas heats about 50% of all homes. Their calculation at the Labor Department seems inaccurate, and the consequence may be a hotter number than in reality. Now, some numbers are intractable. We've had a post-COVID boom in healthcare procedures, so it makes sense that hospital services are up 1%. Hospitals hired 27,000 people, too. Healthcare entirety saw 72,000 new jobs created, a ton for any sector. And it makes sense that in wake of the, the, the medical care index rose 0.5%. I mean, look, they got to raise prices to cover those labor costs. But some things make no sense at all. How could apparel have gone up 0.7% month over month? This is a fungible category. 
We've gotten tons of numbers from so many apparel companies, and I follow a lot of them. I can't recall a single instance of a price increase save denim, which is extremely hot right now. What I do know is that the closeout retailers have had a gigantic amount of business, led by TJ Maxx, which has, they have 1,300 stores. That's TJX. They bring prices down, not up. Again, something's not making sense here for me. Does the CPI report take into account online sellers like the Chinese retailer Temu, which is the second largest shopping app in America as measured by monthly users? They're right behind Amazon. Go there if you haven't. More than 100 million Americans shop at T-E-M-U, Temu. The prices look like something you could have gotten, I don't know, I mean, maybe never. I was thinking like 20 years ago for a lot of it. I mean, just as cheap as Shein with 13.7 million users. Do you think these numbers are factored in the CPI data? You know, I got to wonder because I think the data would be much lower. I bring this up because some of these online bargains are nuts. If you go right now to Temu, you will see 87 cent men's shoes, lots of 39 cent women's outfits, and men's underwear for 35 cents, and women's shoes for 26 cents. I've ordered from the place. Okay, so my wife said that most of the stuff I bought her belonged in a landfill if it didn't catch fire first. But as long as you don't smoke, I mean, the clothes probably aren't a fire hazard. I mean, what's the deal? Look, I have no illusions about some of these numbers. Shelter's up 0.4% month over month. It should be. We don't have exact numbers, but we've likely added about 10 million people from immigration over the last few years. That pushes up the cost of housing. Then, again, it also pushes down wages, which you need in labor shortage. Transportation services like motor vehicle repair aren't going to go down that much. Tough to find new workers in that area, that line of work. But you can join Costco and save 15% on parts and services up to $500. I have no idea how motor vehicle insurance can go straight up, jumping 2.6% in the month of March. That seems outrageous. Is it car theft? Is that what's driving it? Is it something the government should look into maybe as, as it's so off the mark of everything else, say bird flu and influenced eggs? Can you get a lower Costco with their policies for American family insurance? Does the Labor Department include numbers from a firm that counts 105 million U.S. members like Costco does? I go get a free quote from Connect Program, which is a subsidiary of American family, but I don't want to waste Costco workers' time. I'm a member. I'm not going to tax our system. Now, I'm not going to get the Labor Department to adjust its numbers or even ask for certain things. Just like they haven't been able to outsource the non-farm payroll report to paychecks or automatic data, they aren't going to give me the baton for the consumer price index. But the bottom line, trillions of dollars were indeed lost today under the assumption that inflation is way hotter than we thought. And after examining the numbers underneath, considering the companies involved and the prices they charge, I think that may not be true. These headline CPI numbers do not reflect reality as I see it. Let's just hope Fed Chief Jay Powell agrees with me and not them. Let's go to Matt in Connecticut. Matt. Booyah, Jimmy Chill. Yo, Matt, what's shaking, partner? Hey, Jim. Matt from Connecticut. Wanted to get your thoughts on SoundHound AI. No, no. I mean, this thing is, I know, what happened is NVIDIA put a little money with it. It spiked up, and then it's been drifting down, down, down. Trades furiously in after hours trading. I do not think you should own the stock. Let's go to Darcy in Florida. Darcy. Hi, Jim. Love the show. Oh, thanks, Darcy. I wanted Darcy. to tell you that um, you're one of the few people that I trust with stock. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I wanted to know if I should add more Chipotle stock before the 50-to-1 stock split in June. And do you think CMG will continue to outperform after the split? Okay, great questions both. Now, I would tell you that I care more about how the company's doing than the split itself, and the company's doing incredibly well. I do know that after the split, I wouldn't be surprised if people got extra shares. They say, oh, I got so much Chipotle, I'll sell some. So I think in the, you could buy some here, but in the wake of the actual split, uh, it'll run up into the split, and then it will probably go down. But remember, the split is just to make it so that the employees can get more, you know, a whole share. It will make the stock more liquid, which is what I like. Steven in Ohio. Steven. Booyah, Jim, and go Knicks as they head into this playoff run. All right. Well, you know, it wouldn't be so bad to see them in, I uh, guess, the tournament. Not my favorite team, but that's all right. What's happening? Is the stock of Lululemon a buy as they currently trade down? I, I, you know, years ago? I've got to tell you, um, I'm all in Lululemon and I have been for years. But I must admit that the numbers in the last few months were not good, not up to snuff with Lulu. So I pulled back on Lulu. Uh, I pulled back on Nike. And look, I'm even worried about what stock that we own. People know it if you're a member of the, of the investing club. I'm worried about Starbucks, the higher multiple companies that have a lot of business in China that are trading for uh, expensive prices are not working right now. All right. I think the assumption that inflation is, is way hotter than we think is suspect at best. These headline CPI numbers just don't reflect the reality as I see it. Let's just hope Jay Powell agrees with me. Oh, man, buddy, tonight, small caps are under pressure today after that hot CPI number. 
but we're capitalizing on the opportunity by identifying five names in the consumer discretionary space, ones that I think could be worth watching here. Then you know I've been focused on the small cap space, but it's the growth stocks that have marked the averages higher. But could that leadership be in danger, or could growth be a strong corner of the market worth buying and being patient with? I'm going off the charts for answers. And as the spokesperson for the American Migraine Foundation, I'm passionate about those working on diseases impacting the brain. So I'm hearing how MindMed is working to disrupt the space with the CEO. So stay with Freeman. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Cramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Cramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.